this video I will be looking at global warming and in particular covering uh, Unit 4 Topic 5 of A2 Biology at Excel. Global warming is the term that we use for the rapid increase in global temperature over the last century. It's a type of climate change, so a significant change in the weather of a region over a period of at least several decades. Global warming also causes other types of climate change, so changing rainfall patterns and seasonal cycles. Human activities release gaseous waste products into the atmosphere. Since the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increasing. Uh, because of the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. Average CO2 concentration before the 1850s was about 274 parts per million. This number rose to 316 in 1968 and today the concentration is 385 parts per million. So there is a 40% increase since mid 19th century. We also have computer models which can allow us to make predictions into the future. So the current estimation is that in 2075, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will be around 500 to 520 parts per million. On the left here, I have a graph showing the CO2 concentration in parts per million and the years. The average global temperature is shown in red and the CO2 concentration is shown in blue. We can see that it fluctuates, but the overall trend is upwards. The increase in global temperature is somehow related to the increase in carbon dioxide. So we will talk more about the evidence of global warming now. So there are three main things that we need to know when it comes to evidence of global warming. So temperature records, tree rings and pollen and peat bogs. So since the 1850s, we have been measuring temperatures around the world using thermometers. This gives us a reliable but short-term short record of global temperatures. And here I have another graph um, showing the global mean surface temperature um, since 1880. And again, we can see that although there are fluctuations in the temperature, the general trend is upwards. So we can conclude that, yes, since 1880, the global mean surface temperature has been increasing, which again is can be used as evidence of global warming. We use dendrochronology in figuring out how old trees are by using the tree rings. So the rings are formed within the trunk of the tree as it grows. Most trees produce one ring per year, so the thickness of the ring depends on the climate. So the warmer the climate, the thicker the ring will be. And again, I have a picture of the tree rings at the bottom here. From analyzing the thickness, uh, we can also conclude that there is a trend of increasing ring thickness, which suggests that climate of, the tr of when the tree was growing was warmer, which again is evidence of global warming. And finally, we can also use pollen and peat bogs uh, to show how temperature has changed over thousands of years. So pollen is often preserved in peat bogs, which are acidic wetland areas. They peat bogs accumulate in layers, so the age of the preserved pollen increases with the depth. We can take a core from a peat bog and extract pollen grains from the different aged layers, and we can identify the plant species that the pollen came from. Only fully grown mature plant species can produce pollen so the samples only show the species that were successful at, at that time and we can know the climates um, that different plant species live in now so when when they, when we find preserved pollen from similar plants it indicates that the climate was similar when that pollen was produced because plant species vary with climate the preserved pollen will, will also vary as the climate changed over time. So a gradual increase in pollen from a plant species that's more successful in warmer climates would show a rise in temperature. And a decrease in pollen from a plant that needs cold condition would show the same thing. So this again can be used as evidence of global warming. 
let's look at causes of global warming. So as I've already mentioned, human activity has been enhancing the greenhouse effect, producing greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases absorb and emit infrared radiation, which means that in, in the infrared radiation cannot be reflected back into space, but is rather reflected back to the surface um, of the Earth. Greenhouse effect is an essential process that keeps the Earth warm, but if we have too much warmth, that creates a problem. We need to be aware of the greenhouse gases, which are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor, and ozone. Again, I've got a graph here that shows um, the concentrations of the various uh, greenhouse gases and the years. So the black line represents nitrous oxide, green methane, and carbon dioxide. So the concentration of carbon dioxide has increased from 280 parts per million in the 19th century to 380 parts per million. And we can see that in the previous 10,000 years, the concentration was rather stable with, with some fluctuations, but within sort of the same range. And then here, when the Industrial Revolution happened, we can see a very steep increase in both carbon dioxide, methane, and, and nitrous oxide. So carbon, dio carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere through burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, natural gas, and oil. Or it can also come as solid waste, or from tree and wood products. And it can also result from certain chemical reactions, for example, when we manufacture cement. CO2 is then removed from the atmosphere when it is absorbed by plants as part of their biological carbon cycle. So plants would use photosynthesis to <coughs> um, convert CO2 back into oxygen. And we can see the same trend for methane, which is shown in green. So the concentration of methane increased from about 700 parts per billion to 1,700 parts per billion, and it was stable for the previous 850 years. So again, the cause of this is because we're extracting more fossil fuels and we also have more cattle, more cattle. Um, some, of, some, of, some methane can also be released from natural stores, which are frozen. So as the temperature increases, the store starts to melt, releasing methane. We need to be able to interpret evidence of global warming and it could be in a form of a graph. It's important that we know how to recognize correlation or a causal relationship. So the two main things we need to do when we're asked to look at any type of graph or data. First, we need to describe what is happening. So let's, let's look um, at this graph as an example. So we have the year on the x-axis going from 1880 to 2000. And then we have the temperature increase in degrees. Fahrenheit, and here we have the CO2 concentration in parts per million. The red, red line represents carbon dioxide, and the blue line represents the global temperature. So we can describe this, that there are some fluctuations in the global temperature. And then we need to state the general trend. So for both the carbon dioxide and the global temperature, we can see that there is a general trend upwards, so that it is some is increasing. So the, in terms of carbon dioxide, the concentration in parts per million is increasing and the temperature is increasing in degrees of Fahrenheit. And we can also give numerical examples to compare. So we could say, let's say for that in 1880, concentration of carbon dioxide was about 290 parts per million, whereas in 2000, the concentration of carbon dioxide increased to 375. And once we've described the information, either in the graph or in the data, we need to make a conclusion. So in this graph, we can conclude that there is a positive correlation between carbon dioxide concentration and the global temperature, but we can't be certain. So we have to say that they could be linked but we can't conclude that with a 100% certainty because there are other contributory factors that could be involved. So for example, changing solar activity.
and we could mention that further studies need to be carried out to analyze any other factors. The general scientific consensus is that the temperature rise over the past century is closely linked to human activity because of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions due to burning of fossil fuels, but there are about 3% of scientists that believe otherwise. The main arguments that they would be using is that between the 9th and 14th century, there was a medieval warm period where regions experienced an increase in temperatures. For example, you could grow grapes in northern England. And this was followed by a little ice age where global temperatures cooled. Another argument that some people use um, is that computer models that we use to estimate um, climate change patterns can be unreliable. Many of the alternative studies that take place are often funded by oil companies. So this creates a bias in the conclusion of the study. So if a study says a global warming is not caused by burning of fossil fuels, the oil sales will stay the same. The same argument can go for alternative renewable energy companies. So if they say that yes, global warming is caused by burning of fossil fuels. So if you invest into renewable energy sources, you will be reducing the impact, uh, thereby reducing global warming. So then the sales of, let's say, wind turbines will increase. The effects of global warming. So the main effects are a rise in temperature, changing rainfall patterns, seasonal changes are affected, and also economic. So the rise in temperature can affect the metabolism of organisms. So if the temperature is above the optimum temperature, the enzymes within the organism can slow down. And if they slow down, other metabolic reactions slow down. So the rate of growth may decrease and the life cycle becomes shorter. The rise in temperature can also affect species distribution. So if the conditions change and they're no longer ideal, species can move. Or if they're extremely far from the ideal, some species will become extinct. There will be a rise in sea levels because glaciers and sea ice is melting, creating problems for countries like England and the Netherlands, which are very low. Um, and at some point, the prevention of flooding systems that they have in place will be insufficient. So there will be a lot of problems with people losing their homes. When there is a rise in temperature, the environment for mosquitoes and ticks is ideal, so the contraction of diseases may increase. And it's estimated that 30% of plant and animal species that we have today will become extinct by 2050. Another effect of global warming is the changing rainfall patterns, so changes to the amount, intensity, frequency, and the type of precipitation, which can cause flooding or droughts. And we have also seen an increase in, in hurricanes, which are category four and five. So in the past 30 years, those two categories have doubled from the previous years. Seasonal cycles can also be affected. So for example, red squirrels in Canada are giving birth three weeks earlier because of earlier availability of food. And the final effect is economic. So because of flooding and storms, uh, this can cause loss of agriculture, which can then uh, lead to food shortages and become very expensive to rebuild, which can affect government funding and public services. So what can we do to reduce global warming? Since the increase of carbon dioxide is one of the causes of global warming, by knowing how carbon compounds are recycled, we can try and find ways to reduce carbon dioxide. So we can use the carbon cycle, as shown here. It shows the movement of carbon between organisms and the atmosphere. So for example, we can see that cows release CO2 through respiration. We also release CO2 through the burning of trees and fossil fuels. The decomposition of organisms also releases CO2 and extraction of fossil fuels all release carbon dioxide. There is only one arrow going downwards, which is photosynthesis. So to reduce atmospheric CO2, we can either make the amount of CO2 that we release into the atmosphere 
So we need to reduce that, or the amount of carbon dioxide taken out through photosynthesis needs to increase. We can increase photosynthesis by replanting trees, or we can use alternative sources such as biofuels, whereby we burn biomass. Uh, it also releases CO2, but there is no net increase because the amount produced is the same that was taken in when it was growing. And to increase the amount of photosynthesis, so decreasing carbon dioxide concentration, we can re use reforestation. So by planting more trees, more carbon dioxide will be removed from the atmosphere. There are some arguments for and against the use of biofuels and alternative energy sources. So for biofuels, arguments for would include that there will be funding available from the government for farmers to grow biofuel crops and also the price of biofuels is less than that of oil-based products which is beneficial to customers who would be paying less for biofuels they might be more inclined to buy a car that uses biofuels there are some arguments against biofuels so for example in order to grow the crops for the biofuels you will need to use farmland so and this will be reducing the amount of farmland available for crop growing which can lead to food shortages and you also may need to create space for the new farmland so forests may have to be cleared arguments for wind turbines is that the, the companies that produce will support um, the use of wind turbines because that will increase the sales for that company but also turbines produce electricity without contributing CO2 thereby reducing the effects of global warming some arguments against wind turbines include the ruin of scenery natural beauty of the countryside so that can be used by local residents finally we need to look at two practicals that we need to be aware of so how temperature af affects organisms so first of all we need to know the experiment uh, when we vary the temperature and how this aff affects the growth of seedlings and how temperature affects the hatch rate of brine shrimp so with seedling growth we first need to take plant seedlings and measure their height we then plant them into some soil and put them into in an incubator at different temperatures an incubator is a machine that keeps a, a steady temperature so we can decide on a range of temperatures to compare we have to control as many variables as possible so such as water content the ph of the soil light intensity on carbon dioxide concentration so after a period of incubation, um, it could be 5, 10 or 15, 20 days, we then measure the height again. And then this allows us to calculate the average growth rate. So if we um, divide average change in height by the incubation period, we will have the average growth rate. We can then use this to plot um, our data onto, let's say, a graph. And if we see that if we increase the temperature and the height of the seedling also increases we can then conclude that an increase in temperature increases the growth rate and the other experiment with brine shrimp so we take an equal number of eggs and we put them into water baths at different temperatures we have to control as many variables as possible so the volume of water the salinity the presence of chlorine if we're using tap water and O2 concentration every five hours we need to record the number of hedged brine shrimp and again, this allows us to calculate the hatch rate. So by dividing the number of hedged brine shrimp by the number of hours allows us to get the hatch rate, which we can then plot on a graph. And if we see that if we increase the temperature and there is an increase in hatch rate, this gives us the conclusion of the experiment. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you very much for listening.